Hello, my name is Maya Kuhn, and I warmly welcome you to RCCG Living Spring Miracle Center. Here at Living Spring, we love God passionately, we love others compassionately, and we love ourselves unconditionally. We're glad that you're part of our service, and we believe that you'll be richly blessed in all that we do today. So why don't you take a seat back, relax, and get excited because God has something in store for you today. God bless you as you do so. Heavenly Father, I ask in the name of Jesus that you brood over this house. Holy Spirit, thank you for your presence in our midst. And as your word comes, Lord God of heaven, let every heart be blessed. Let every soul, O oh Lord God, find you. And Father, let all the glory be yours. For in Jesus' name we've worshipped. Shall we be seated? I bring greetings from our senior pastor. Um, she was in communications this morning. She's praying for us. And I just want to thank the pastorate for the opportunity to be here. So this uh, month, month of July, the theme uh, for the church is yea and amen. Two weeks ago at one out, we looked into the con you know, concept of yea and amen. And for those of us who may not know, um, that theme was taken from Second Corinthians chapter 1 from verse 19 to 21. So in that place, the Bible makes us know that in Christ Jesus, all the promises of God are yea and amen. Another translation says that in Christ Jesus, all the promises find their answer. And just a quick recap for those of us that were not in Walnut, we went back to establish, you know, what are the promises? And we went to Genesis and we looked, the first time God made a promise was to Abraham. And in that place in Genesis, God said to Abraham, your offspring, um, said in your offspring, the whole families of the earth will be blessed. And so in the New Testament, we are told that the offspring is actually Jesus. The Bible did not say your offsprings, plural, it said your offspring. And God spoke and said that there will be a, 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 a seed, a branch of Jesse will come out, still talking about Jesus. So the scripture was fulfilled in Christ Jesus. So we also looked at now that the promise of God has been made, what were the conditions for us to, you know, for be partakers of those promises? And we looked at different things, one of which is that you have to be born again. We had a family tree that showed that, you know, the promise was made to Abraham and his offspring. And really what qualifies you to be a partaker of the promise is that you have to be a part of that large family of God. The Bible makes it clear that we, the Gentiles, will be grafted as an offshoot into the lineage. And so we become joint heirs with Christ. We're no longer servants, but the Bible says we're now heirs with Christ and joint heirs with him. So the, what qualifies us to partake of the promise of God is that you're going to be born again. And then we looked at other things. One of that is that there's also patience. The Bible says that God came to Abraham after Abraham was 75 years old when God spoke to him the first time. But Abraham waited patiently. He had Isaac just about 100 years old. So there's a waiting period. So just because you're born again doesn't mean that every single promise will start to be manifest. So we looked at that. But today we're going to take another swipe at this year and amen. So just something I want us to know. If you go to, we're going to look at a scripture. Um, Numbers 20, 23. Please take your note because, you know, this is, this is more like a teaching. Um, Numbers 23, verse 19. We just want to establish a few things. It says, God is not man that he should lie. Or a son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said and will not do it? Or has he spoken? And will he not fulfill it? I just want us to understand that everything God has said is 
without going back on his word. So if the promises of God find an answer in Christ Jesus, why are we then not living in the fullness of the promises? Is it that God is not giving up his part? Is it that Christ is you know, falling short of his role? Or is it us? So today we're going to find out what I titled Barriers to Answered Prayers. Amen? There are, you know, some of you that, you know, are good, you know, in social media, there are all sorts of things happening now. People are, they would call them prayer contractors. <laughs> you just pay money. And they will pray for you. Amen? <laughs> Um, you know, if you're running for election, they will say, uh, just come, we'll pray for you, you win. If you're, if you're trying to buy a house, just <laughs> don't save money, just come, they'll pray for you, the house will come. So you see all kinds of things, and then people are confused. But it does not diminish the potency of the word of God. The Bible says that the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous avails much. So today we don't have a lot of time, so we're going to go fast. So, there are a few things that I've, um, as I prayed for this message, the Lord laid a few things on my, on my mind. Five things, five barriers that can stop your prayers from being answered. Barrier number one, envy. Envy. What is envy? Envy is an emotion which occurs when a person lacks another superior quality, achievement, or possession, and either desires it or wishes that the other lacked it. In other words, if I can't have it, no one else can have it. I like the way Aristotle put it. He says, envy, he defined envy as pain. Someone say pain. Pain at the sight of of another's good fortune, stirred by those who have what we ought to have. Now, you, you might think, well, what is he talking about? Let's go back. Genesis chapter 4. I just want you to know that the first sin was pride. Satan became prideful and was cast out of heaven with his, you know, co-angels. The second sin was disobedience, Adam and Eve. Guess what the third sin was? The very first time that Adam had a child, the first sin was envy. Genesis chapter 4, if you read from in that place, you get to verse 8. Cain and Abel had just offered sacrifice. The Bible says Abel's sacrifice was pleasing to God. But for Cain, God did not accept his sacrifice. What happened? Envy. In ver and God said to Cain, what is your problem? If you do well, you will be accepted. But the Bible says Cain was angry and then took his brother to the field. In verse 8, Cain kills Abel. You might say, well, I've not killed anybody. But brethren, how do we react when someone gets up here, they just bought a house? Or you go to their house warming, and it's way bigger than your house. How do we take that? The Bible says that God weighs the heart. You know, there are so many ways these things show up. Most of us, if you can Tolerate people's progress. And I am coming to something. We say things like, ah, why are you buying all this house? How many children do you have? Why, why do, why, how many cars do you want to have? Why do you need a, a fourth car? It's not your business. But see, those are the manifestations of envy. And why do we become envious? It's because we have not understood that in Deuteronomy, the Bible says, it is the Lord thy God, it is I, it is me, it is I that giveth thee the power to make wealth. 
So that it's not of him that will it, neither of him that run it, but it's the Lord that showeth mercy. For the race is not to the swift, the Bible says, but time and chance happens to them all. You know, everybody wants to be a millionaire. And please, we need more millionaires. It is good so that the church bills can be paid. But if you cannot stand a millionaire, how do you want to become one? How these rich people, that's what they do. It's not going to happen. And so sometimes when we pray and we're not getting an answers, it's because our heart is not right. The place we read in James chapter 4, 1 to 10, I like the way the NLT put it. It actually x-rays what, why we don't get answers to our prayers. We're just going to look at scriptures, see what God said in scriptures. Galatians 5.25, it says, If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Now, you might say this is Paul talking. Now, let's hear what God said. God said in Ezekiel 35, he said, verse 11, he said, Therefore, as I live. Now, when God is saying, as the Lord liveth. <laughs> now, anywhere you see in scripture, when God says, as I liveth. Meaning, there's no going back. Hear what God said. He says, therefore, as I live, declares the Lord. I will deal with you according to the anger and envy that you showed because of your hatred against them. And I will make myself known among them. When I judge you. I didn't say it. Now, this is judgment because somebody, a, group, a nation showed anger and envy towards the Israelites. The Bible tells us in New Testament that we're the Israelites of God. In Christ Jesus, there's neither Jew nor Gentiles. So this scripture applies to any child of God. In other words, God is saying, when you envy my child, I will deal with you. That is God. I didn't say it. It gets serious. Now let's go in scriptures. We're not going to read it. We know the story of Jezebel. We know the story of Ahab, the husband. In 1 Kings chapter 21, if you have time, read it. Verse 1 to 29. Tells the story of a king. Now, this is the height of envy. You are the king. You have a palace. You have the land rights to the entire nation. And there's Naboth, a very, a, a, just a poor man who has a small farm. And the king saw this farm, what they call vineyard, and says, I want it. He said, listen, how much do you want me to pay you for this? And if you don't want me to pay you, I can give you another vineyard. You ask yourself, king, if you really want a vineyard, why don't you convert one of your land to a vineyard? Or ask neighbors to show you the way. He didn't stop there. The Bible says he became so angry that he, he just laid down and the wife came. May God help us to marry good wives. So the wife now added Fear to fire. He said, King, what is wrong with you? Don't you own the land? Just watch. Brethren, don't play with women. Women are, women, if, if a woman is good, they're good. If a woman is bad, they're terrible. Amen? <laughs> so what happened? Jezebel said, don't worry. I'll get you this. Jezebel plotted to have Naboth killed. Here, what is, which is what God said to to Ahab. And as soon as Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, Ahab rose to go down to the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite, to take possession of it. The word of the Lord came to Elijah, the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, who is in Samaria. Behold, he is in the vineyard of Naboth, where he has gone to take possession. And you 
shall say to him, Thus says the Lord, Have you killed and also taken possession? And you shall say to him, Thus says the Lord, In the place where dogs licked up the blood of Naboth, shall dogs lick up your own blood. He didn't stop there. And then Elijah said to, Ahab said to Elijah, Have you found me, O my enemy? I'm going to fast forward. Now, Elijah said, I have found you because you have sold yourself to do what is evil in the sight of the Lord. I'll bring disaster upon you. I will utterly burn you up and will cut you off from Ahab, every male born or free in Israel. I'll make your house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Baasha, the son of Ahijah. For the anger to which you have provoked me, and because you have made Israel to sin. We'll stop there. I, I want us to know that this is serious. Envy. Nothing gets God mad. Because think about it. If let's pretend you are God. You have all these children. You give one a car. And then another of your child is so angry at that person. You as a father, how would you feel? Because we forget that we're all God's children. And like I said at the workers' meeting, nobody is better than the other person. We are all members of the same body. If your foot is paining you, your head cannot sleep. What God intends is that everybody will have something. That we should have sufficiency. So we must get rid of envy. If, God, if you want God to answer your prayers, rejoice with them that rejoice. And mourn with them that mourn. Is it in your Bible? Somebody is getting married. They invited you. They are paying $100 per head to feed you. You sit down there. And all you do is criticize their wedding dress. Oh, why is the dress? Ah, the chest should be better. Ah, what? Doesn't she know she's big behind? Why is she? No. Is that your business? Eat and rejoice with them. Amen? I can go on and on and on and on. But we're going to go to the next point. The next point, the next one barrier to unanswered prayer is pride. Somebody say pride. What is pride? Short definition. It's inordinate self-esteem. Where it is you and the rest. The place we read in, um, in James chapter 4, verse 6. He said, God gives grace to the humble and resists the proud. Now, do you know what resist means? Ma, please, can you come? I want us to see what resist means. So, pretend I'm God. And you're praying to me. You're, you know, you're trying to come close to me. And I'm telling the angels to push you back. Push you back. That is what resist. Amen? Resistance. Some of us that did physics. Resistance is an opposing force. The Bible tells us clearly that God resists. You don't want the almighty God to resist you. Amen? Please have a seat. So every day when we gather as Christians... We have a closing grace. And we say, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us. That's true. But, if you have pride, it won't work. Because the, God, the word of God cannot be broken. The Bible says, he watches over his word to perform it. If God has said that he will resist the proud and give grace to the humble, it means that when you're not humble, that grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter how many times you say it, will not be with you. Amen? No, I didn't say it. It is in the Bible. Now, some of us may, may say, well, I'm not proud. I just want to tell us that humility is not low self-esteem. That is not. Opposite of pride is humility. And some people think that when you have low self-esteem, you are hiding from everybody. That's not humility. Humility is knowing 
your place. But choosing to be low. The Bible says Jesus Christ did not count it robbery. Being God to come down in the form of man. To die for us. Even death on the cross. The worst death you could have is to be to die as a criminal when you have no sin. The Bible says he was tried in all things and yet without sin. Humility. Now, I'm going to tell us 11 signs that shows we're proud. Because this thing is plaguing our society. We're going to see. Sign number one. The f- what, please write these things down. The first sign that shows you are proud is when you think you are humble. <laughs> ah, you know me. <laughs> I'm very humble. Though. <laughs> eh, who told you? See, let the people tell you you're, hum- you're humble. The Bible says, by their fruit you shall know them. So, the first sign is to be telling people, I know me, I don't talk too much. Eh? You've just finished saying everything. Though. I know me, I don't talk too much. Who told you you don't talk too much? Number two, you do not accept constructive criticism. Ah, no, 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 you can't talk to me, you can't talk to me like that. Huh? Who told you? Even Jesus called the disciples said, who do people say I am? You know, there was, Jesus was trying to double check. And they said, some say you're Elijah. Some say you're John. So, okay, what, what about you? Who do you say I am? Jesus is trying to get feedback. Remember, Jesus was here in the form of man. He left his heavenly glory. Because you say, well, is it not God? Why would he be asking people? No. The Bible said he left his glory and came down. So as a child of God, that he was a son of God, he wanted to make sure that he's fulfilling his ministry. He said, so what do you, who do you say I am? In other words, he wants to be. Yes. Now if you think that's not enough, the Bible says John's disciple, John sent his disciples, John the Baptist. I hope you read our Bibles. And they come to Jesus and they say, we want to know if you are the Jesus, if you are the Messiah. Now remember, John baptized Jesus and heaven has opened. So I still don't know, sir, ma. What happened to John the Baptist? You baptized Jesus, heaven opened, and the words came and said, this is my, my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased. Now, Jesus starts his ministry. And now you are sending your disciples. But what, what did Jesus answer? He said, go tell him that the blind see, the lame walked. In other words, Jesus is saying, the works that I do, they bear witness. Amen? So, my brother, my sister, when you cannot be corrected, you are proud though. There's something I do with people. Everybody, look at the tip of your nose. Just look. Look now. Everybody, please, let's do it. Can you look at the tip of your nose? Let's try it. I know it's, it's silly, but can we try it? Now, in terms of proximity, your nose is right in front of your eyes. No matter how big your eyes are, they will never see the tip of your nose. You know why? It is too close to be seen. There are certain things about us that we will not know because it is us. Therefore, you need people to give you a feedback. That's why you have the mirror. You dress with a mirror because you can't see everything. Amen? So, someone who cannot accept criticism is proud. Point number three. You always want to be the center of attention. Ah, hey, I go shoot them. Hey, what are you talking about? By the time I come out, they go no say, ah, sorry, I'm speaking pidgin English. You always want to be at the center. Every, you must carry force. Every, no one should exist. And see, brethren, we can laugh. These are the things that plague us. Why must it be you? You know, one time my son, 
he lost and he was upset. I said, yes. I said, son, that's how it works. You lose some, you gain some. You can always win. I said, how, imagine how you feel now. I said, so if you win all the time, that means everyone else will always lose after lose to you. They will feel this way. I said, is that fair? Life is you win, you gain. Okay. If you are the only rich person in your family, you are in trouble. You won't sleep. You wake up and they have 20, 20 text messages. And it's all about send money, send money, right? But what if you empower other people? Then you have peace of mind. Must you be the center of attention? Amen? Praise the Lord. Number four. You are vain about your physical appearance. Now I have to explain. There's nothing wrong with looking good. The Bible says God weighs the intent of the heart. See, if I, I told this story before. One time I went to Masha. So this shirt was $12. $12.99. My first reaction is, ah, man, this shirt is cool, man. When I deck this shirt, deck is the slang we used to use back then. When I wear this shirt, and God said, if you buy this shirt, I already, I already had this shirt in the cart. As I walked around the store, my mind, my spirit was saying, no, you're buying this shirt to show off. I took it back. I said I would never buy this shirt. And I didn't buy it. Amen? It's not the shirt that's the problem. It is my heart. Because I want to show, ah, when you come out buying Gucci, Far uh, Faragamo, whatever what they call it, Gucci, Prada, you turn yourself to a billboard. You're advertising for Gucci, you're advertising for um, Versace, you're adver ad advertising for which, which ones? And they're not paying you a cent. In fact, you are paying Gucci to advertise for them. Isn't that? Now, again, please. I'm not saying it's wrong. What I'm saying is, let the intention be right. See, when I travel, I, sometimes I pay for a certain cabin seat. Not because when I'm coming out of the plane, everybody will know where I'm coming from. No. But I'm asking myself, there are people that I might sit next to and we're going to have a conversation. And maybe in the process, I can tell them about Jesus. And I've done it. So the intention should be right. Please, buy good clothes. The Bible says Solomon was arrayed in purple linen. God bless Solomon. So it is not a sin to have good stuff. Well, let the intention be right. I shared that before. There was a car I bought. Nice car. Somebody called me. Sir, let's, uh, what are you doing after work? I said, I'm going home. Sir, let's go and, and go somewhere. Else. I said, me. In my okay. God forbid. He said, ah, if I have your car, I'll pick girls. I said, me. I said, the car that God gave me is for his glory. Do you understand? So when we're dressing, let's check our intention. It's good to look good, right? But let the intention be right. Number five. You do not like to associate with ordinary people. So when you show up to a party, you just throw like this. And you're, you wear your sunglasses. You scope everybody. You find the, 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 winner, the movers and shakers. That's not what Jesus said. Though. Have you noticed that in Jesus' ministry, there was no high table? He said, make them sit on the grass. Are you telling me that there was no chairs in, in Israel? Je Joseph was a carpenter. So why didn't Jesus order tables and chairs and set a high table? You, James, uh, John, Peter, you put sit on the high table. No, he made them serve. Amen. He said to Peter, what do we have? Peter said, Lord, are you kidding me? How are we going to feed this? It's okay, fine. There's a lad with the, the loaves and fishes. Of, and, and the fishes. It's okay, make them sit down. Let's not be puffed up. You know, the king in Daniel, the Bible says, you have been weighed been found wanting. We know the story, right? 
So let's calm down. You have, you don't have. It doesn't matter. I've seen the rich die. I've also seen the poor die. Solomon said, all is vanity. Is it bad to have? No. But please, don't, as, don't make association based on this class. If you're educated, that's fine. Bring the other person up. Amen? If you're talented, fine. Bring the other people up. It, it's bad enough to be down there and then for someone to remind you that you don't belong. That's double tragedy. Amen? Are we getting something? All right. Number six. You are proud if you are fond of name dropping. Now, let me explain it. Ah. You talk to somebody very fun. Oh, I was just with uh, Joe Biden last week. <laughs> yeah. No, I was in Lagos. Uh, me and the governor, we just had lunch. In fact, I'm flying out on a first class ticket. Uh, the governor is coming to town. You are dropping names so people would think you are up there. Wait. How many people have you said, I just finished hanging out with Jesus? We don't say it. Oh, you know, I just had a quiet time. I had a good time with the Lord. Man, you know, in fact, God showed me revelation. No. But we're going to drop names. Oh, tell the last daughter is my friend. Oh, the minister of health. You know, those nonsense. What about you? Why don't you use your own name? You know, I was traveling to Nigeria one time. I was, I was in one cabin, you know. I was the youngest person there. Everybody just wants to know who I am. Who are you? You know that was they want to know who my father is because I look I look very young. So they thought man, I'm, maybe I'm the son of one rich man. I kept saying I'm I'm Imam Ugoke. But it wasn't enough. Why why does why do I have to be the son of somebody? I already have my own children. So it's not is it not enough that I, I am me and I have children? Do you understand? So there's a culture of let me know your friends so that, you know, you belong. Not for Christians. We should be authentic. Your best self. Because the Bible says, you're fearfully and wonderfully made. Amen? Amen? <sighs> Number seven. You're not teachable. We've talked about it. You know everything. Nobody can teach. In fact, by the time somebody is talking to you, you're already tuning out. You interrupt them, cut them off. I don't know what you're talking about. Okay. Even if you know what they're talking about, give them the opportunity. Because the Bible says, and we know in part. I'm here. I'm not a pastor. I'm just a deacon. I don't know it all. So, by right, ma, your pastor, your pastor, you shouldn't be sitting here listening to me. Well, what is this boy talking about? But God gives different grace, different skills. Even when you think you're better, listen. Nobody knows everything. The day you stop learning, you start dying. I learned from my children. If I say some word, they'll be like, Dad, that's not how you say it. Okay, you Americans, how do you say it? And I will learn, and I got better. You must be teachable. Amen? The next is, you do not listen to others' advice. They're kind of linked, so I'm not going to dwell on that. Number nine, you do not like to be surpassed by anyone. You're always competing. You're driving a BMW. Someone buys a Ferrari. Now, you want to have a Ferrari. Ah, how can someone in that church drive a better car than me? What is your problem? Is, is life a competition? You just bought native. You now show up. Somebody has another list. They say this is the reigning one. Now you must get that one. No. You know, it's good to be competitive. But you know the best way to compete? Compete against your old self. 
Now let me explain. So, it, where I was last year, if I try to be better today than last year, that's a healthy competition. Because I'm investing in me to make me better. Because my success does not have anything to do with the success of the next person. Because there's something called destiny. Everyone's destiny is different. If you own a BMW, you go and buy a Ferrari. That Ferrari might kill you. It's true. And who knows if you waited, maybe you buy a Ferrari in the fullness of time. So let's stop competing. So why are you competing? What is even there to compete about? Just be happy. Serve God. And let God get you to where he wants you to be. Now don't be lazy. I'm not saying to be lazy. I hope you understand it. Point number 10. You think you are too important to do mundane things. See, we're going to have barbecue. You go outside. There's trash. Can I take trash? No. It has not come to that. A whole me. The king. Kinema. If I put this jacket down to pick trash. Eh. Hmm. If you read the Bible, we're told that Jesus washed the feet of the, of the apostles. We've heard about servant leadership. If you feel too big to do anything in your house, you are the husband. I know, how can I make breakfast? What are you talking about? Where I come from, you don't make breakfast. You know what? That's true. And that is why where you come from, they're where they are today. Now, brethren, think about it. You spend $500,000, half a million dollars to buy a house. And you're feeling too big to sweep the kitchen. Something's wrong. Am I right? Because if I spend, if you can buy a Bugatti, a Bugatti costs you like $3 million, and you see a dust, won't you wipe it? So it is your house. The toilet is dirty. You won't clean it. You pee, man. You sprinkle, and you go. And you tell your wife, ah, what do you mean? How can I be clean the toilet? What have you told me to in this house? No, you're getting it wrong. Oh, in my place, we don't do it. Men don't go to the kitchen. So this idea of where I come from. Fine. Why did you leave where you come from? To be here. Okay, here, where we are. That is how we do it. If you don't want to do it the way we do it here, go back to where you come from. <laughs> do you get me? Now, full disclosure. Listen, I cook, I clean. My wife is here. There's nothing I don't do. What are we doing to ourselves? Then we're raising children who think that it's only the man has to do certain things, the woman has to do certain things, so they get married and they're having problems and we're praying. Coming to Night Vigil to pray. Stop praying Night Vigil. Go and apologize and tell your children you show them the wrong example. Roll your sleeves. Help your wife cut tomatoes, and as she's cooking, go behind her, hold her from the back, kiss her, say sweet things. I bet you, your night is going to be long. Amen? Can I go on? <sighs> Let me tell a true story. When my mother first came, my mother came from the village. When she first came to this country, me, I like to, in the, on Saturday morning, I got downstairs. The kids were sleeping. My wife was upstairs. My mom was in the you know, room downstairs by the kitchen. So I was getting my breakfast thing ready. My mom came out. I said, Doc, Doc, what are you doing? I said, Mom, what, do, what does it look like I'm doing? She said, ah, where's Biola? I said, Biola is sleeping. Ah, and you are cooking? I said, yes, anything wrong with her? <laughs> she went back <laughs> to her room. She came out. Hey, let me do it. I said, Mom, you sit down. I said, Mom, this is how we do it. She said, ah. So my mom, true story. She start, she was she put her hand like this. 
As my mom was looking at me, me, I was cutting my tomatoes. I made a nice breakfast. I said, okay, fine. Everyone sit down. And I served them. My mom, culture shock. So I called her, I said, mom, see, see this is my wife. Mm-hmm. We're going to get old together. So we have to help each other. I said, mom, if she gets old, I'm in trouble. So this is how we do it to mom. You're in this house, so, so don't complain. No. <laughs> because think about it. When you are dating, didn't you guys cook together? So what happened? Your skills left after the wedding night? She will cook, 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 cook. She will run around. She will go to the grocery. She will do all that. Then the night, you won't let her rest. Then you call pastor. My wife is depriving me. Why would she deprive you? She's exhausted. Let's, let's leave this matter. Point number 11. You are critical to those who do better than you. When somebody does something that you can't do, you find a way to say, eh, anyway, that dress is nice, but I don't like that color. It would have been nicer if she just took, you know she's very dark. Why did she pick that color? Eh? She could have just gotten another color. It is a lie. It is just what we call bad bele. For those of you who are not Nigeria, bad bele means extreme jealousy. If they pay you away, eh? they're spinning you. You're angry that someone has something that you can't have. These things will stand in our way to have access to God. So what is holding us from getting the promises is us. So, I'm going to talk about this last point and then I'll leave you alone. The next big problem is what is called unforgiveness. The one barrier to unanswered prayer is unforgiveness. The Bible says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not hear me. Is it in your Bible? Okay. Can you put up that that slide? Yeah, there's a a slide uh, on unforgiveness, please. That cup. So, unforgiveness is like drinking a cup of poison and hoping it hurts the other person. See, if somebody offends you, if you don't forgive them, you're stopping yourself. We are told that if we don't forgive our neighbor, God will not forgive us. So many times, if I offend my wife, even when she's wrong, but I know we're not in good, pe- in good terms, I have to wake up and pray. I will tap her. I will say I'm sorry so that I can pray. You must learn to forgive. Matthew 6, um, Matthew verse 6, it says, but if you refuse to forgive others, your father will not forgive your sins. You must forgive one another. They, they ask Jesus, teach us how to pray. Say, forgive us our sins. As we forgive those who sin against us. And listen, and we can just fight. Ah, hmm. Dr. Emma, you don't know what she did to me. I get it. Do, we, do you know what we did to God? The, 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 the song we sang, the next verse says, when I think that God, his son, not sparing, sent him to die for us. See, on the cross, my brothers gladly bearing, he bled to take away my sin. Do you think it was, it was fun for God to allow Jesus to die? But God forgave us. Now, I'm going to say something very, very controversial. Even if your spouse 
cheats on you. Forgive. You may not be together if you choose to. But you must forgive. Do you understand that? The, Jesus said, the only reason Moses will give you a certificate of divorce is because of yes, hardness of heart. Thank you, man. So, don't say, ah. The Bible said, ah, if you commit adultery, I shouldn't forgive. That, the Bible did not say you shouldn't forgive. It said you can divorce. But you must forgive. Because with the measure that you give, shall be given to you. In other words, they asked Jesus, how many times will my brother sin against me? Seven times, Peter. He said, no. Seventy times seven. Please, there's no place in the Bible that says you should not forgive. There's no sin that is too much to forgive. It does not mean if a friend stabs you in the back, forgive the person, but be careful. If you shared your secret with someone and they disappointed you, forgive them, but stop sharing your secret. Don't hold grudges because you are the one that suffer. Amen? Before we come to the throne of grace, we should make peace with God. What happened in the Old Testament was, and it was an illustration of what is going to happen. The high priest has to first go make atonement for his own sin, then go into the Holy of Holies. They put a rope in case. Because to stand before God, you have to be clean. Therefore, that's why when we pray, we ask that God forgive us. The Bible says, even if you want to give offering, and you remember they have something against your brother, you say, hold on first. Go and make peace. Do you understand? So don't be dancing here. Praising the Lord always. But your, your husband and I, you're not talking to each other. You drove to church. Everybody was making eyes left, eyes right. And you want to come and give. What are you doing? Who are you fooling? What does it, say to, what does it take to say, I'm sorry? Let us make peace. Amen? The Bible says a servant of God must not strive. Ah, I would never over my dead body. Wait, over your dead body. Hey, it's not that bad now. Over my dead body. Why? Who owns the body? It's not God. Unforgiveness. I'm going to stop here. I'm going to mention the other points, and by God's grace, in the future, we'll address it. The other point is ignorance and unbelief. Sometimes we pray the wrong prayer. If you want to travel to Nigeria, go buy a ticket. Don't pray, God, take me to Nigeria. There's there are principles, right? So sometimes it's ignorance. Some things we have to are praying for. We don't have to just find the information, do what you need to do, and get it. Amen. And of course, unbelief. Sometimes we judge. And you're not, you don't even believe what you're saying. See, prayer is not a recitation. Prayer is communication with God. Tell God. One time my wife really annoyed me. I said, God, I'm very mad at my wife. I said, God, what she did there, ah, if not for you. It's true. I'm telling God how I feel. That is what prayer is about. If you have a child and your child just comes to you and says, oh, oh, Daddy, uh, Daddy, oh, 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 oh. you say, Hold on, hold on, son, what do you want? You want your child to communicate. So when we pray, let's be mindful of what we're saying. And the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Shall we rise? As I speak to us, I also speak to myself. The Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. If we say we are without sin, we are lying. So if you find yourself in this category, something that happened to Ahab, the Bible says, and Ahab, when Ahab got the judgment of God, the Bible says he tore his cloth. He was sober. And God said to Elijah, Be 
because Ahab has shown repentance, I will not bring upon him what I've state, uh, said to him in his lifetime. I'll bring it upon his children. So God forgave Ahab. That's the God we serve. So I don't care where you have been before today. If you would just repent and ask God to help you. The Bible says he giveth grace to the humble. If we can humble ourselves, that place we read in James chapter 4, the last verse said, humble yourself before God and he will lift you up in honor. Let us cry to God. Let us ask any area of all these things we mentioned where we find ourselves trapped. God is merciful. He will forgive us. He will help us. He will grant grace so that our prayers are not hindered anymore. So that we can come boldly to the throne of grace. Let's just pray. Let's talk to God quietly. Just one minute. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Our Heavenly Father, we are thankful. Father, we know that you wish above all things that we prosper and be in health, even as our soul prospers. Father, you say we should draw near to you because then you draw near to us. You want fellowship with us. But all these things, God is creating a, a barrier between us and you. Father, you know us. You know our frailty. You know we are weak. Your word says your strength is made perfect in our weakness. So that when we are weak, you are strong. Our Lord and our God, I ask in the name of Jesus that you look up at us, O God. We are here. We are vulnerable. Some of us are struggling with unforgiveness. Some of us are struggling with envy and jealousy. Some of us are struggling with pride. Some of us are wallowing in ignorance. Some of us, life circumstances have made it hard for us to believe any word that comes out of your mouth, Lord. But Father, you are so merciful. Please help us in the name of Jesus. Father, you want to bless us. But the enemy has sown all these habits, all these traits in our lives. My Father, my God, I stand in the authority of your word. I decree that every tree that you did not plant in the lives of your children, Father, we uproot in the name of Jesus. Your word said that there shall be no enchantment against Jacob. Father, no divination against Israel. For this, your children, whatever the enemy has put in them that has caused a separation between them and you, that has caused our prayers to hit a hard ceiling tonight, let that come to an end in the name of Jesus. Father, let us live here with a newness of life, with a better understanding that is not just by praying, but by following your word. Open our eyes, Lord. Teach us to love you. Teach us to do things to bring you glory in the name of Jesus. Thank you for your church because you build your church and the gates of hell would never prevail against it. All this we pray in Jesus' name. And the church says, Amen. I trust today's service has been of great blessing to you. I would like to stay in touch with you. So why don't you connect with us on any of our social media platforms? at RCCG LSMC on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. Remain blessed and we'll see you next time.